Okay, we're over here at Geiger Key, uh, getting ready to launch. Got all set up with the Tarpon 140. Uh, this is going to be part four of the It's All About the Bait series, and we're going to focus on catching bait strategies, how to find it. Uh, so, I guess before we even get started, one of the first tips I can get for you is always take a look at the launch area that you're launching from. Usually, especially if you're using a boat launch, especially these rough ones where there's, it's a dirt launch. Uh, but anyways, they tend to have about the only drop off in, a, in the area, especially the keys where it's mostly flats. And then the boat launches are dug out. This happens to be part of a channel, but you can see how deep it gets. So what happens is this pocket right here, because it's wider than the rest, it gets very narrow along the left. Uh, the pilchers come in in big schools and they basically get stuck here and they'll just be tons of pilchers in here. Same thing with the mullets, they like always like the sandy uh, dirt bottoms. So they'll come into these quiet areas and you'll see them schooling around here. And even a couple videos ago, there was ballyhoo just sitting along the edges for some reason. Um, but step one is just look at where you launch and you might be uh, find stuff. Okay, let's talk equipment for helping you find the bait. See the bait is probably more specific. But uh, one of the things that's very important is a nice good pair of polarized sunglasses. Um, I happen to use Costas. Um, and actually, I learned uh, about uh, bait catching down here from a uh, professional charter captain who was kind of like cheat taught me how fish down here and uh, one of the first trips that we took out for was to uh, stock up on uh, pilchards for uh, his upcoming uh, charters so I would go out with him in the afternoons after work and then uh, we'd hit the flats and then uh, I started off by driving the boat while he was still in the cast net from the front of the bow of the boat but uh, I remember He'd go along and then generally the, the guy in the bow, the bow with the net would point and then give instructions and so forth. So he started to say like, okay, uh, just follow along this um, this little channel. And then I just had regular uh, cheap glasses. I don't remember what they were, sunglasses. And I'm looking, I, I can't see any differences. I, I, don't, I don't see it. Then I just drive, okay. And then he says, no, follow the channel, follow the channel. I'm like, I don't see the channel. And I just, Ugh. and he, he was a, uh, real knowledgeable captain down here, long time uh, uh, commercial and charter fisherman, but uh, he was the most patient about the stuff, so it was kind of like, yeah, you focus and you learn, so, which was good. But then, uh, as we go farther, then he'd say, okay, you see all the, f they're flashing, they're flashing, just kind of go towards them. And I'm, of course, looking, and with the glare, I can't see anything, and <laughs> so it started, he started getting frustrated because then we go just directly to hand signals the whole time. I wasn't seeing anything, even when we're on top of him and he's pointing down, I still couldn't see him. So finally, when we got back, the first thing we did is got in his truck and then we drove over to, I can't even remember what store it was, but someplace, one of the tackle shops that had sunglasses and then all of a sudden I had my first pair of uh, $120 Costas and that was pretty much it. Uh, not a lot of option, it was either get the glasses or don't go fishing with them anymore so I inherit those really quick but uh, you definitely don't have to get these real high expensive name brand ones but you definitely do want to make sure that they're polarized polarized um, you could probably get those little fishing ones for about 20 bucks 15 20 bucks at Kmart Walmart wherever uh, if you're looking for the better ones definitely uh, go into these uh, sunglass shops and try them out make sure they fit your face um, one of the best things you can do is just go fishing with friends and there's always that gearhead guy that's always got to have the best of everything. Can't fish with the crap, but they got to have the best of everything and look good. But uh, then you can try their glasses on and, and see the differences even between the cheap glasses that you might have or just to see by different brands and then pick what you like. But very important, the glasses. Okay, here's a good example of what you can see from the sitting position. And this is ultra, ultra clear water and it's only maybe six inches deep. Okay, and this is what you can see from standing up. This is why you see those uh, flats boats. They've got the, the standing pulling platform in the back that gets them another three foot, four foot. This is the higher that you can get, the more you can see and clearer. So I can see all the way to the uh, edge of the mangroves 
and all the way through that water to know I could see a tiny crab if it was walking around. Very important standing up. The next tip is know your tides. Just like uh, learning to fish the flats, it's uh, very important to know what your tides are going to be when you're chasing bait. Like right now the, the water is three, four inches maybe deep where normally you can see it's about a foot higher at a higher tide. Uh, bait follows that same pattern. They don't want to be stuck in this really thin water because they'll just get nabbed by all the birds and so forth and become easy targets. Uh, so they'll come in when the higher tide and then uh, they'll head out when uh, the tide gets real low. So uh, knowing your tide is just as important for finding bait as it is fishing. So you check how clear that water is. This grass is below water, but it looks like it's sitting above it. Another tip just as important as knowing their tides is also knowing the migration patterns of the species of bait that you're looking for. Uh, just like you wouldn't come in December to uh, try to catch a big migrating tarpon because they're April through August and they're just not here in December. Same thing now, like uh, we've just pretty much ended the second uh, mullet migration here in the Keys. Uh, so we're right at the end tail of it. There's uh, two of them basically that uh, April through August and then another one uh, here in the tail ends of September, October, November. But then again, there's a big school of them right there, so it does exist, just like there are still tarpon around. But uh, to know those um, patterns of bait, and then that'll help you to pick the correct bait for what the fish are eating. So being fall time right now, what's happening is with the cooler weather, the uh, pilchards and sardines and glass minnows are coming in and flooding the flats. So that would be the uh, bait priority right now. Okay, here's a key sign. Um, I just came from over here over there where it's all clear water we could see crystal clear and then we just transitioned right over this edge and then all of a sudden it's milky and muddy now what happened that would cause that there's no like a uh, current coming through here it's not like a, a channel what it is it's bait fish and if you can watch down there's little flashes and this is whole thing is full of pilchards right now so they're coming in here and they're either feeding or doing something where it's churning up the uh, the silty bottom and I can see it's just flashes. I really can't see it because it's muddy but I see those little silver specks and flashes. Occasionally I'll see a little jump. So one and done would be this spot. Another tip, uh, even when you're fun paddling, when I'm just getting from point A to point B, I generally always follow the shorelines in fairly close because that's what I'm looking for is these situations. If I'm just out to that brown patch, it's clear and I would never know it. But as soon as I come in here and I saw this uh, muddied up water, I know something's been in here churning it up. And such a large volume like this means it has to be a big school of something. And it's basically pilchards. But uh, whenever you're just paddling around, I'm always, always just looking for those little specks and little flashes and just little jumps. Uh, looking for the birds sitting around. Just all these little telltale signs. All you need is that one little flicker and you can run into a big school and you know and you'll be set. Um, even though you may not be looking for bait at that moment, but if you find that pattern where they're sitting, you can just come back to it. So I know this area here is kind of a, gonna be a nice little hot spot. I don't know if you can see them, but there's the mullets. All right in there. So that's the other thing that's churning up the bottom. Nice little school of mullet, but this is my mullet spot that I always come to. So it's just hundreds of them all in these little buckets. Those are the things that are uh, churning up the bottom. I didn't bring my rigs to run mullet, but that would probably be been a good option. Instead, oh, and these are all pilchards. So a big old mass of pilchards. And where you find those, you find the other fish. So this is like a bait heaven right here. This is one and overdone. A another tip is these little uh, coves that are natural form coves where they're very sheltered from the wind. A lot of bait likes to tuck in those areas and just kind of, I find lots of schools of the circular, circular patterned uh, mullet swimming in there and the, the pilchards will go and hide there. A lot of times the uh, fish will corral them into these things 
and gobble them up. So it's always a good spot or right out front here. So this whole bottom is just full of bait. I've explained this a lot on my other videos, but you see the uh, pelicans. Now most people think, oh, you got to wait and uh, look for uh, pelicans that are diving. No, it's just even where the uh, pelicans are just sitting there or sitting in the trees, they're in prime real estate where the food is. They don't just land there just for the sake of, oh, this is a nice feeling tree. They're doing it because food is very close by and they might not be feeding right now, but yet they're going to be in the vicinity of all those mullet there, the vicinity of all where the food is. So if you see big um, flocks of uh, pelicans like this, somewhere in this vicinity, they might be scattered out in the flats. Most of the time they're running and hiding along these edges here, especially at low tide. They'll look for little channels to hide in, but don't always have to look for diving pelicans. Yes, that means they're 100% diving on food, but they will be in the vicinity that you'll find the bait. You can kind of tell that it's going to be a good indication with all these. <laughs> all these, there's probably 15 of them there, another 10 there, three there, that this is a prime real estate for bait. One thing you could utilize with actually birds crossing flats is if you watch a bird fly across the flat, what will happen is that uh, any bait fish around will cause it, will make them jump and, and uh, break the surface. So as you see something, any type of bird just fly low along the flats, just watch them and then you'll see little speckles of uh, bait fish jumping and that'll be a good indication of what's around. And uh, remember about specifically the pelicans, uh, when they crash on bait, if they keep their heads down in the water, it's most likely glass minnows, which are all these right here. However, if they dive and crash and then they bring their head out of the water right away, then that also most likely means uh, pilchards, which are also mixed in here. So that's why there's all these guys and even more over here. One of my uh, favorite spots to find uh, bait, uh, a lot of pilchards, sardines, mullet, is in these uh, mangrove edges right alongside uh, a main channel wherever there's water flow and what happens is these corners edges get um, are deeper cuts so what's here it's super flats and then on this side it tapers down and gets deeper as you get close to the mangroves what happens is that uh, when it gets uh, shallow like this the bait have to get congested in any deep spots and it's these uh, corner cuts over here and they also like it because it brings a food bag back uh, right through them. Whether it's becoming an outgoing tide, it'll move food through here, or an incoming tide, it'll move food uh, right through there to them. Uh, being right alongside those mangroves gives them a uh, means for escape from birds. It keeps them out of the sun so they can't be seen very well. So a lot of these edges get packed really heavily. So I always, always check anywhere there's a, a channel where there's water moving through, just like on that other side over there, I'll look for the deep spots along those edges, and then that's where the bait is going to coagulate. Okay, for pinfish, what I'm looking for is live turtle grass in some kind of current. Um, as you see, I catch a lot of pinfish at the pipes by the NAS. It's because there's always current moving in and out of those pipes. Well, the same thing is effective when you go to some random flats. What I look for is live turtle grass, healthy turtle grass, because that's where pinfish hide. They hide into all the roots and all the, the stems and keep the, just dodge in and out of it. Um, for larger pinfish, I like to go between two to four feet. Smaller pinfish, you can get from six inches to, to two inches or two above. Um, you do have to think though of how heavy your cast net is because pinfish are extremely quick and you'll need to be able to either have a large diameter cast net or one that sinks pretty quickly. So if you don't and you have like I use the basic five foot net, you want to go into a shallower water like this where it's maybe a foot, 18 inches, maximum two feet because it needs quickly drop. Now the other thing that's important is this is right off of the channel there. So again, lots of water flow. Now, if I was on the flats, what I generally would do was do some sort of chumming. 
uh, either bring out the chum bag or throw out some chunk pieces of bait on there to get the pinfish to come to me. The other way would be to uh, line and hook them, which is I use all the time as well. Uh, do a small Carolina rig with a really tiny hook on it, cast it out, and just slowly reel it back through the weeds. Then fan cast it, and just keep fan casting it. They generally run in schools, so once you find catch one the, the size you want to, just keep hitting that area, and there's generally a school there. But uh, this is kind of what the, the grass that I'm looking for whenever I'm out. Uh, I also uh, target the grassy like this and then spots that have white sand, uh, little patches. They like to hang out as, as well and I'll, it makes it nicer so I could just cast into the white sand and then I don't have to worry about snagging on the grass. A uh, tip for finding mullet is look for these uh, kind of sheltered little coves. Um, I prefer finding white sand or sandy bottom but anything that's kind of sheltered you'll often find the schools of uh, mullet tucked in and hiding in there. Here we've got these little coves built in here. It's not really uh, mullet season but these are some of the spots that I would always find them in and they would tuck in real close to the mangroves. Um, I would see them from a long distance. You'll see them kind of popping and rolling every once in a while and you know there's something there but then you go up there and there'd be hundreds of them just packed in side by side underneath a cut right along the mangroves there. Um, or you'll see them just running in circles, big schools of them. But uh, they, they like the sheltered areas and that's where they'll hang out. But otherwise you'll see schools moving up and down the mangrove edges or running around. Uh, just look for them getting busted on. But uh, these are nice little hideaway spots to look for them. Looking for mullet is a lot of times you're looking for is the nervous water. Like a, a couple schools went by here and it creates a wake. Um, just like a little V kind of going through because it's a school and they just kind of follow along. Uh, just think of it as like a, a tailing redfish or bonefish or permit just gliding through and when it's calm it just creates a little V shape but then there's 10, 15, 20 of them so it's a little bit wider and just going through there. So you'll know that there's a, a school that's running around and you want to just set up and get ready for them and throw the net on them. Okay, we've kind of talked about the standing on your kayak and looking for bait and uh, the signs of what to look for and now let's talk about the physical act of throwing the the net on the uh, the target species. Oh we've already done the how to throw the net but now the, the strategy part of it is a little bit uh, more basic okay. The saying that I go by when I'm targeting to throw my cast net on bait is always focus on one and done and what that means is I really only want to throw that net once get the bait I need put it in the bucket and get to fishing because the key part of what it is you always want to remember the 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 more you spend time the more time you spend uh, chasing bait the less time you have chasing the fish which is the actual ultimate goal so the one and done comes into play is basically another way of saying be patient. Don't be all, oh I see something over there and just kind of half-heartedly just throw it out that direction. The first thing that happens when you do that is your net doesn't open. Okay, because you rushed it, you'll either not uh, go through and uh, clear the net correctly or you won't set it up correctly or you'll, you'll rush throwing it and you'll jam all the weights together and it'll just end up in a clump. The bait scatters and is gone and you've just wasted that whole experience there, that whole chance. Okay, versus you see the bait where it's at, okay, you don't spook it. Maybe if you run up on them, you stop, you back up so that they don't take off. Okay, you get yourself settled, um, you're out of the way so you're not going to spook them. You get your net all set up then you start taking a look at the most strategic way of where to throw at them. Okay, So let's say for instance uh, that big log is where all the bait is at. 
Um, I'll run up on them. I'll see the bait over there like whoa So I'll backpedal out of there real nice and calm get out of the distance. So they're still hanging out of there Everything's good So I want to take a big deep breath. Okay The first thing I want to do is kind of take a look around Okay, the most important thing is that you always want to throw the net downwind most important thing throwing a net into the wind or cross corner from the wind always ends up with a bad throw okay it's very hard to, to open up a net into the wind okay so it's a much easier and more natural throwing with the wind downwind okay so that's the first thing you'll do scope out which direction that I need to be in order for that wind to be to my back and then directly at the fish the other thing that does is is that when you uh, have the wind directly in your back it generally keeps your kayak centered straight towards it and that usually means that the waves are coming straight from the back to front no side to side uh, slop which will throw you and make you off balance all right so that part of it is like probably the most important aspect out of all of it now let's say this coming i know this is the angle that i want it's straight there okay I'm going to get that net into like a ready position. I'll make sure it's all cleared. Maybe I won't uh, get it set up because I still need to travel this distance from there to there. So I'll get it maybe to that half point where it's just dangling in one hand, not loaded up with the, the, the left hand. And then I could still paddle using that net just at a, a loose position. And usually you'll have to use your pole anchor in order to stay not drift into them while you're getting set up so a lot of times all it is is just a matter of pulling your pole anchor putting that away and just letting the wind drift slowly push you towards your target area there and again once you find that you're getting in a momentum you're going the right direction um, everything looks good you're stable then you can go ahead and prep your net get your net to the full pull on position okay so you're in that ready mode um, everything looks good, your drift is good, use the rudder to keep you centered. If not, you might have to do a quick little paddle adjustment. Then you can put the paddle down, try to be as quiet as possible. Get your net set, okay? And don't be too early, okay? If you've done it right and they're not, you're not uh, very erratic and not banging plastic, they'll generally stay. Get to where a point where you've got them really within range where you're not really having to heave it and then throw your net. Boom. Got it. Close it up. One and done. And you're out of there. So just take your time versus you rush it, you throw it, you make a mistake and it doesn't open. They take off and then what happens? You have to go searching all that time to try to find a new spot for another bait school. So very important. One and done. Okay, that's our day for the bait strategies. I could go on and on and on and on, but uh, realistically, that, that's the thing, is that it could be very technical. Um, you're talking a lot of different species, different conditions, the different environments that they live in, the different ways they react. Um, it's just tons of variables, when to find them, what seasons, so forth. So realistically, what does it take to do it? Um, get the basic gist of the uh, seasonality of the bait you're looking for and then you just gotta put in time um, be hyper vigilant about uh, where you're at and your surroundings looking for birds are so important looking for just that little speck flipping in the in the sun just that little glistening speck I found big schools of pilchers just by that uh, I'm a hundred feet away but I just see just a little glisten in the, the wind from in the water from the sun reflecting off of it. Pile over there and there's a, just a nice big school of mullet or uh, pilchers there. So it's just that kind of stuff. You just be very, have to be very hyper vigilant about your environment and what's going on and keeping an eye out. Always cruising along the mangroves when you're just fun paddling, finding spots. It's really no different than fishing. Uh, you put in your time and you, you, you learn by experience so at High tide, these are the good spots to go. At low tide, these are the spots to go. And the mornings go here, at night, it's just exactly like fishing. So that's also a reason why I like it so much, it's just like fishing. It's just another, another variable that I could challenge myself with. But if you put the time and effort in, it'll definitely increase your uh,
catching uh, skills and uh, you just really be are in tune to the environment when you're become a real good bait chaser and that easily carries on to uh, catching fish so uh, keep an eye on my videos there's also always um, bait tips thrown in there because it almost always evolves around it and uh, just get out there and experience it so anyways thanks for watching uh, next part of this will be I'm not sure of because that covers the gist of things um, I might just throw in some few knickknacks here and there but otherwise thanks for watching